Right. Sounds good. Welcome to the smartest people in the room. We are glad you are here. And just by showing up today, you're already demonstrating your very own smarts. Today, I am thrilled to present two guys who are longtime friends, former colleagues, and who are both successful music industry entrepreneurs, and also the perfect example of what I strive to present every episode, and that is really smart people doing really cool work. I promise you will leave today smarter and more enlightened than you arrived. Before we get started, please let me take care of some business. First, to the audience, please feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat window. The reason we do these webinars is twofold. First, we wanna showcase really smart people and the amazing work they do day to day in the music industry. But the second reason is a bit more nuanced. Many of you know that I am a music industry headhunter. I run the music practice at Turnkey ZRG and I place music executives in roles throughout the industry. So by definition and function, I help people connect with companies. And in this series, my goal is to help you make more connections and I invite you to take full advantage of that opportunity. Specifically, I invite you to engage with the speakers and the other attendees in the chat of the Zoom. Please introduce yourselves, share your LinkedIn profile, say hello to your friends and make some new ones and ask questions of our speakers. We will try to address as many of those as possible during the session. Also, please make sure your chat is set to address everyone, not just the host and speakers. I wanna thank our program sponsors for without their support, we could not keep this series free. Special thank you to First Horizon Bank, Turnkey ZRG, the Tennessee Entertainment Commission, MedJet, Tennessee Brew Works, Project Music, and Better Than Booze. And a quick note about MedJet, which is the number one rated international medical transport service and security, ah, can't even talk, security transport service for membership for travelers. If you travel a lot, you need to look into this. Sorry about that, guys. So let's get down to business. In today's host seat, we welcome Jason Feinberg. Jason is a marketing technology and strategy executive who's held senior leadership roles at Universal Music Group, Pandora, Concord, and Epitaph. His experience combining the creative world of artists with an engineer level understanding of technology has developed an uncommon skill set perfectly situated to grow fan bases, revenues, and businesses in the modern music marketplace. Jason has deployed marketing and technology initiatives for artists including Guns N' Roses, U2, Frank Zappa, Bad Religion, The Beatles, Nico Case, and Tom Waits, and for brands including Starbucks and AT&T. As SVP of Marketing at UMG, Jason restructured and led the department overseeing disciplines including audience growth, product development, social, CRM, media buy-in, e-commerce, e and insights. At Pandora, he served as head of artist marketing, launching and running Pandora's artist marketing platform called AMP. Jason current, currently consults on strategy and technology and product development for record labels, music tech, and content platforms. He's also a lecturer in the music industry major at UCLA and a maniacal vinyl collector. I can't wait to hear more about that in a minute. And joining as today's featured guest is Edward Guinness. Edward is an accomplished entrepreneur and investor with over two decades of experience in entertainment, content distribution, and technology. His expertise encompasses large-scale distributed systems, Web3, AR and VR, spatial computing, and AI. He started his career in LA as a software engineer and later held key roles at Concord Music Group and Village Roadshow Entertainment Group, focusing on corporate technology and software integrations. In 2013, he co-founded OpenPlay, leading it to become a top content and rights management solution in the music industry. His work involves spearheading future development, driving client growth, and advocating industry-wide innovation for betterment of all rights holders. Additionally, he advises startups like Westcott Milta Media and Screening Space, and has also helped co-found Pronto, a hologram company. It is a pleasure to welcome these two rock stars to our platform today. Take it away, boys. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Tom. Edward Guinness. <laughs> Jason Feinberg. I, I am I'm exhausted by just hearing your bio. Uh, I, I, I know. <laughs> it's crazy. It's, uh, uh, it's the, the amount an of embarrassment of, of riches. 
the amount of uh, of uh, change that you've kind of seen over the last fifteen years is uh, it's pretty it's pretty pretty enlightening. Uh, I've always been a big fan. Ah, well, thank you. Likewise, yeah, it's uh, I guess a, a restless spirit, you know, coupled with an endless sense of curiosity has uh, led me from gig to gig and. You know, perhaps career trajectory wise, I guess the wisdom maybe don't go place to place to place, but for like a spiritual currency and a fulfillment of curiosity you know, aspect, it's been great checking out all these different technologies and platforms and just seeing it evolve. I mean, you and I have been in it together. I mean, that's for those that don't know, I know Tom gave a bit of a heads up here, but Edward and I go way back, infinitely back to the origin of time and space, practically. Uh, we first met at Concord Music Group. Um, I had a digital marketing agency, and Concord was my biggest client. And through an, an interesting series of events, perhaps we'll get into, um, I ended up joining Concord. And that was uh, an incredibly fortunate moment in my life where I became partners in crime with this gentleman. And seeing his leadership and technology understanding and vision has played a role in my career, undoubtedly. And uh, that's the last nice thing I'm going to say about you on this entire Zoom. Excellent. Well, I, you know, I, I, I keep forgetting how long we've known each other. It's been, of course, 15 years. And uh, you, you kind of fell into Concord, uh, like many of us back then fell into Concord when it was a, a very different organization. Uh, remind me, you know, how, wh why did you make that leap into, into a, a label? The, the super long story, to not make this entire hour about that, uh, is... I was running my marketing agency. I ran it for seven years. It was great to be in early in digital and you know, working with majors and distributors and managers and really figuring out what direct to consumer and, and engagement and interactivity meant in the digital space. Uh, and the very long story is uh, I was a marketing partner of a very large direct to consumer vendor that was very popular in 2010. And um, Concord was interested in using them. And I was already up and running with a few uh, Concord artists. I arranged a meeting between the two companies at the Concord office. Uh, I show up. The room is packed with chief officers and label teams and technology teams. And the vendor had the day wrong. And they didn't show up. So I, I improvised. I, I made some jazz out of it. And I ran everyone through a very large Concord artist account on the platform explain my philosophy on direct to consumer and digital strategy and i'm thinking oh i'm about to double my billing cha-ching and at the end uh, a chief officer named gene rumsey one of the greatest rest in peace pulls me into his office and basically said in a nutshell you're no longer a vendor you're going to come here and run this for us and too good an opportunity to refuse and so into concord i went you know you know you? It, I it's 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 very interesting because uh, uh i i was very involved and very aware when you joined um uh, and it was only a few years after my tenure uh started there and uh you know I, the the first thought i had was how good can this guy be if he's shutting down his company with like the first <laughs> client that says come on board so you know it was uh until fair, until like fair. i saw you in action which which was actually pretty quick for 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 those for that time, uh, and for those kind of in the audience, this was an early time in music, right? This this was early time in digital music. So the the work that Jason was was is, is kind of talking about, we'll delve into, is you know really paving the way for a lot of things that we see today that were absolutely not common stay uh, back in like two thousand six, two thousand seven, two thousand eight, where a lot of this was was be kind of being being honed in. Um, and I, uh, you know, fell to, into Concord completely unexpectedly. I mean, my my parents were not very thrilled when I told them I'm I'm joining into the music space. You know, I'm a former engineer and uh, very much was always involved in kind of more of the operational side of things, the less sexy side of any industry. Uh, and you know, I, I I I in my in my tenure, I saw myself going to Google, to Facebook, to Microsoft, and you know, doing that 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 uh the approach uh but um i started consulting and i started helping concord in the very early days of 2005 2004 where they just you know got funding to really go and buy big things and uh, i was really intrigued uh at the time because you know this small or small label um primarily you know, jazz focused at the time 
had these huge aspirations, uh, but no technology whatsoever. So uh, to me, that was super exciting. And uh, probably the most impactful reason why I joined was Bob Valentine. You know, he not only at the time was also relatively new to Concord, uh, but he also had a vision that, you know, was very articulate. He, he, he knew how, what he wanted to see this scale into and gave a lot of autonomy. And at that time, autonomy was more important to me than, than currency, right? Uh, so for, for technologists like ourselves, sometimes the freedom to do things is kind of the most important thing we can find. Um, so that, that's basically, you know, how I, I, I fell into it. Concord uh, was one of those magical places where uh, everything seemed possible uh, because one, yeah. I didn't know anything about the past in the industry. So I didn't have these preconceived notions of like, oh, you can't do this, or this is the way it's always worked. I, I had no idea. So I, I, I literally just started to do things the way I thought they should be done. And I had the, the latitude and freedom and the support to do it, which I think, again, today, this day and age, that is hard to find. Yeah, that, that spirit of entrepreneurship is a thread throughout your entire career. And I would say throughout your very being. I mean, it, that's if I had to sum you up in one word, it, it's uh, that I would say on this Zoom, it's certainly entrepreneur. And, you know, that's a great, I'm going to go back and defend my honor just a little bit. <laughs> you know, how good could I have been if I left my company to join Concord? A valid question. I think a better question was how good was my company? But it's not, it, what was interesting about this, entrepreneurship was the answer at the end of the day. Um, I see a, a very dear friend, Larry Weintraub is in the chat. And you know, he was, uh, I was working closely with him at the time and he uh, running Fanscape you know, really guided me along learning entrepreneurship, running my business. And one of the things anyone that's watching this as an entrepreneur can understand is you have to always have one eye on the business. You might be in the business doing the work, but with one eye on the business, you're always thinking about what's the two-year plan, five-year plan, a 10-year plan. And I was seven years into this company and it was going well. I had established myself in the industry. It was really my launching pad, save for a couple indie gigs or indie label gigs beforehand. Uh, but I got to the moment of, I need one of three things, an investor to scale, a partner to scale, or an exit to do something else. And I was exploring all three of those. And I had momentum down each path. And when this moment at Concord happened, that was a very clear answer to wh which path seemed the most compelling. Because I also saw what you talked about, that entrepreneurship opportunity to come in and build a division at Concord, right? With some of the greatest artists in the world, you know, Paul McCartney, Carol King, you know, Prestige and these jazz catalogs, Rounder acquisition. There was so much happening and it was such an early, exciting time. And I think why you and I connected day one was that a combination of seeing the opportunity and the overlap of technology and art. And I think that's, are the yin and the yang of us? I mean, look at our backgrounds, right? Like we are I, I, the perfectly matched pair. You know, it, and, and it just happens that you joined the business development group at Concord. Not you didn't get corralled into a marketing program or a D two C program. You got pulled into business development as a whole, which encompassed those areas. But because you got pulled into the business development, we almost had this unique entrepreneurial. Uh, era that we went through, even within Concord, well before we spun out OpenPlay. You know, I, I, I'm thinking back in in the, the various products we came up with and pitched together in the market. You know, we we uh, uh, early days before there was a definitive streaming winner. As many know, Concord was in a very close partnership with Starbucks, and it was a very successful program. There was a lot of opportunity that that stemmed from there. And uh, what you and I picked up on was. You know, how, how, how does a brand like Starbucks potentially expand into music even further than the physical products they were selling? Um, and uh, as you know, part of a collective group within Concord, we were pitching a new streaming service, right? From, from within a, a record label, pitching a streaming <laughs> service to a company like Starbucks that's saying that they should launch this. They should use their brand power. I mean, at the time, everyone was nascent, right? There was no clear winner like a Spotify that's or right. an Apple. It was, it was really just uh, an opportunity to, to see if we can not only convince a brand to build a product, but actually execute 
on that product, which uh, I, I can't imagine, I can't even think of a single label today that, you know, has the, 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 the want and the, 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 the chutzpah to kind of build products and pitch them out into the wild to groups like Starbucks. Um, yeah, that was a, an incredible moment. And I think not just at Concord, but in the industry in general, right? 2010, 2011, where it was clearly, we saw the future, right? Streaming was really starting to take hold. You had all the early players, a few too early, but um, enough coming in where a market was evolving. Downloads were still very real. Um, CDs were still certainly very real for us at Concord. Uh, you know, I mean, the, that counter space at Starbucks for the Hear Music Initiative was you know, printing money, essentially, until it wasn't, until Biscotti <laughs> was printing more money. Yep. Uh, but, you know, to the ability to overlap the artistic opportunity of finding audiences directly, engaging with them, and then bringing streaming and, and getting ahead of it, right? Not waiting for the industry to come to us and rewrite our P&Ls, essentially, but instead us work with a partner with a footprint like Starbucks and try to innovate and get ahead of the game and launch a streaming service. That was one of the most incredible moments in my career, just the, the left brain, right brain connectivity of how do you pull all these pieces together and essentially rewrite the consumer experience in the music industry. And, and, yeah, and, I mean, obviously and, we've seen 14 years of development since, but it's, you know, we, I'd like to think we're pretty early to that idea. You know, we, 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 we had a few of these kind of entrepreneurial adventures. Uh, do, you, do you remember Tune Up, our music therapy yeah, sure play? Uh, we, at, at, you know, within Concord, one of the business development leads at Concord was a gentleman named Mark Morgenstern, who uh, was, you know, a, an awesome, awesome individual who really found niche areas for us to pursue. And one of those was healthcare. Uh, and uh, again, now, if you look at, you know, the markets, health and music and wellness is is kind of part of our, our day-to-day DNA. But in 2010, when we you know thought of how, how does Concord or uh, groups like Concord leverage this amazing music, which a lot of it you know had therapeutic value in a way that could be done in a, in a way that it could be valuable to insurance companies, to truck drivers, and and Jason you know was very involved with me. Uh, and if you remember, we we spent a lot of time dealing with and talking with musicologists. Uh, we spent a lot of time right. with, with therapy experts and actually built an app uh, that uh, ran on uh, uh, the technology that we then spun off later into, into open play. But that foundation was where, you know, the, that entrepreneurial pursuit was really baked in. And I, you know, those were some of the best times in my career. That's, that's a perfect segue. Let's talk about how open play came to be because I have a very distinct memory of being in a conference room with a whiteboard trying to solve some problems, uh, a very blank whiteboard with some very big problems. So let's hear about it. And, and, and yeah, it, you, you, you were obviously there from kind of the early days, but uh, as, as, as everyone in this audience knows, Concord is a kind of an acquisitions machine. They are, they not only have this process, down to a science, but they're excellent at it. At not only acquiring catalogs, valuing catalogs, but bringing them in and getting them really synchronized in the market. Um, this is not by just happenstance. This this is a lot of thought and investment that went in uh, to creating this these vehicles that, that that are in play today. And when I joined, I was thrown in right into its first set of acquisitions. In fact, Fantasy Records was our my kind of my first foray and this was a brand that's iconic right and that has been uh, a, a legend in 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 the music space and uh you know concord was a much smaller entity than fantasy at the time that we bought them uh and i at the time didn't know what i didn't know so i i i knew that we had to acquire and know what we own know what the assets are, know how the royalties are processed and try to create a semblance of an organization between what Concord had and its first acquisition. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, we did a lot of things wrong, uh, a lot of things right, uh, but learned a lot in this process uh, that paved the way for the next several acquisitions with Telarc out of, out of Ohio, Rounder out of Boston. Uh, and each one of these acquisitions, you know, I thought that, that there would be some sort of synergy between these acquisitions, that there would be a similarity of systems, processes, workflows. 
boy, was I wrong. Uh, you know, everybody did, <laughs> even though music is music and ends up in, retail, in consumer hands in the same ways, everyone feels like they're a snowflake in how they actually get to that end result. There was no standardization of any kind. Uh, everyone had everything homegrown. This was not sustainable. And, and, and Bob Valentine, coming back to, to him, he was such a driver of automation, especially when it comes yeah. to financial yeah. analysis. As, as you know, he was very involved in, in some of the best kind of P&L modeling I think we've seen in the market. Uh, and uh, to, 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 to that end, in order to facilitate those dreams, we had to create systems and organization that programmatically kind of made things more, more feasible. Otherwise, bigger acquisitions would just take years to process and get out the door. So a lot of the foundation for what that whiteboard started out coming from was how do we make this easier? How do we take all these things we've learned from these acquisitions and rather than repeating the same thing every single time, why don't we figure out how we broaden this market? How do we create something that we can reuse with every group? Every, every acquisition has a process that can be brought into one central place. Um, and I also thought a little bit further than just our own walls, right? I, I, the building things for the sake of one organization, awesome. Building something that can then be scaled, that potentially be useful elsewhere as, as the market grows, that actually has had the most pronounced you know, interest for me. Um, and I also made, wanted to make sure we, we brought in the development team, which is now my co-founder, Brady uh, Brim DeForest, who was led the product program, uh, to really create kind of a, a consumer feel of the program. Because everything to date, if you remember tools in 2010, they were like they were they were they were not really user friendly. They they that was not even a concept that was really focused on then. It was all just function over form. But we wanted to attract everyone in that organization to 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 participate and use a system. And the only way to do that is to make it feel like they're they're at home using something that they'd be using on sure. their phones or on their computers. So that whiteboard, when you walked in my office and I asked you, like, you know, how are we going to do this? It was really started with how are we going to take these learnings and and really start to shape them into a system and a process and a workflow. Yeah, that was a really fun time to just think through like what does in our vision and then with the guidance of, of Glenn Barrows and Bob and, and all the leadership at the company, what does the long term vision look like? And it's it's the things you just outlined seamless acquisition, uh, ingestion of data and royalties and processing and automation, um, self-sufficiency, the ability to plug in directly to new partners and new opportunities. You know, as I was running digital strategy and D2C and digital biz dev, like there was so many new partnership opportunities where once this platform was in place, it was incredibly easy to just deliver the repertoire ingest the, the, you know, whatever was coming back, whether it was data or royalties. I remember we built out very early analytics platforms that were marrying rudimentary social data with, with digital download data with sound scan data. And, and you know, this was 15 years ago. There were a few players in the space, but we saw the need to build something bespoke because of the scale of the company and trying to future-proof. I mean, that's, that's so much of the game. You, you know, it's 2024, and even to this day, I have yet to see some of the complex, intelligent data modeling that we were doing in 2009 and 2010 with Bob, right? I think, again, well ahead of its time in what was feasible to be done with data. And again, we were looking at it from the least sexy part of our industry, which was the yes. automation side of the financial processing, the financial identification. But that's where the, the, the real wins were. We, you know, we found money in places you'd never find because once you organize yeah. your data, and this is a message to everyone on this, on this, on this thread, anyone who really takes the time to, to organize their content in one place where they control it, they command it, they're then able yes. to exploit in ways that they're not even contemplating yet, whether it's backend or in the markets, there's so much opportunity to, to that organization. And, and, and Concord saw that you know, 15 years ago. And, and I, I, we, yeah. we need more in our market today to be thinking this way. I mean, I, I, there's a few. Oh, you just went on auto mute somehow.
that's so strange. Yeah, there, there are and there are groups that you know you you know and I know in the market today that are doing amazing things with data, like Andrew at Big Machine and others who are kind of looking at this landscape in a in a way that I'm really interested in and you are as well. Concord was doing this in in you know 15 years ago that I think has been has been amazing um, and I think led to a lot of the work that we've done. Uh, but I, I do say, Jason, you were a huge influence on a few major parts of open play as it was being built, specifically because historically, if you recall, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, the area of, of what I would consider production was like two guys in a room that knew how to use a distribution system to put in metadata and just get that stuff mm -hmm. out the door. Uh, nobody thought holistically of integrating marketing and business affairs and 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 PR and every aspect of a of a label into a system that is centralized. And I think this is what I really, you know, when we were whiteboarding out, I didn't want to just have the whiteboard focused on the marriage between a, a release, a track, and a work, and just the metadata yeah. that it contained. It was all the marketing things elements you were working with. How do we store that D 2 C campaign and all of its assets in one place, connected to this release, connected to this project? How do we store the marketing blurbs that can be then automated into automated EPK experiences, which you were very involved with when we were really rolling these things out at scale? That is what I think what made OpenPlay so magical. It wasn't just limited to just one department and one organization that is being more efficient. It's everyone in the company being more efficient. Yeah, yeah. I think that efficiency in things like acquisition is a great example. I mean, uh, many, many, many companies exist today simply to acquire labels, to provide centralized label services, and to to scale a business. And you know, it's the work hasn't changed, right? The needs are identical. You have to have accurate ingestion. You have to be very clear on ownership, on royalty processing, automate as much as you can. The tools have increased tremendously in this time, but the, but the fundamental foundational work hasn't changed. You know, and then back to the, just a slight asterisk to the acquisition thing. I remember, this is a word of warning to anyone doing business with Edward. Uh, you and I then toured the country a little bit, going to Telearc and to Rounder and a few other offices. And um, my warning is never let Edward control the rental car and timing because I don't think we ever made our flights back on time. This is- well, um, I, I, I'd this say though, those who know me well, Jason, know that I have sometimes a, a very casual relationship with time. You do, uh, you, you know, do. I, 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 like, like many other creatives, I can get really deep into what I'm doing and time gets lost. And I, I also have a hard time ending conversations uh, when I'm really yes, intrigued right. in the topic. So my, my only, you know, saving grace is, as I tell this to others, is uh, if I'm late for you, it's most likely I'm going to be late for the next person. So it's, it's really, you know, I, I tried to stay and be involved. And but yes, Jason is right. I don't think we we made a single flight or a single rental car on time. Uh, that was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> you probably haven't since. No, nope, so that's, that's, yeah. let's 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 look more about the landscape today. Right, because you know, I think we're in, in full agreement that those foundational elements, centralization, process, automation, cleanliness of data, self-sufficiency, those have existed as long as this industry has existed in some fashion or another. Um, but today they are the business, right? You know, like uh, you said earlier, some of these things are unsexy and I, I am proud to be the unsexiest guy in the music business if this is the case, because these are the fascinating problems to solve. As much as I've spent a lot of my career on the artistic side, whether it's marketing or I was a session guitarist, I, I've, I've, I've been across the entire spectrum. Uh, but right now where my head is at and a through line, I'm sure it goes back to my early days as a software engineer, is this notion of building technology and platforms to solve the real problems and the real money-making problems that exist in the music industry today. So... What do you see if you had to pick your top few issues that are both tremendous opportunities but tremendous problems to solve? What do you see? Blockchain and NFTs. No, no, I'm kidding. Uh, we, yes, the, the, mic drop, <laughs> zoom over, go buy uh, as much Ethereum and NFTs as you can, everybody. Bye. The, 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 the basic message that I still preach even, even to this day and, and hasn't changed much since when we launched OpenPlay uh, is that regardless of what the next technology is, regardless of what 
the the evolution of of the space looks like it all predicates on knowing what you own controlling what you own and having all the accurate metadata attribution data because at the end of the day having that in one place where you can tap into and or your partners can can tap into is so critical to whether you're dealing with AI, whether you're dealing with all of the new technologies coming out with data automation and all of the services that are coming up all and apps being built, they're all predicated on this data level. Uh, and uh, it, it, it has such profound impact, not just on what's coming next, but how people are getting paid and how the data is getting disseminated out into the world. You know, one of the things that I had to really wrap my head around was distribution and what that meant for the industry when I first joined, because it changed so much, right? 20 years ago, pick packing and shipping was distribution. You had warehouses, you had all these facilities and people that had to be involved. And that was really what, you know, I thought of traditional distribution uh, was, was, was taking our content, make manufacturing it, storing it, and then getting it into consumer hands. Well, that's evolved tremendously. Now, you know, getting music to services, getting music to anyone, you know, it's a, it's a digital delivery. It's, a, it's, it's, it's almost completely insignificant in cost and time, but in order for it to be valuable, you have to have control over that content, over that data. Um, and uh, unfortunately, even today, to this day in 2024, you know, you have companies that are using Salesforce to manage all of their, 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 their lists and campaigns and marketing programs but they have nothing similar managing their music metadata, their content. They are reliant on third parties to kind of do that for them, not even contemplating how long they might be in business with those third parties. And I'm always kind of surprised when I hear this to this extent, because end of the day, it's like saying, you know what, I'm going to have my entire accounting only managed by this one firm. I don't need to have a copy of my QuickBooks. I don't even need it. I don't care about it. I'm just going to have these guys tell me everything I need to know about it. I'll use their systems. Uh, this this just never sat well with me. Uh, I, I, I value relationships with distributors. I think distributors have a very critical role in our market. I think it's evolved tremendously in, in, in 20 years. Uh, but I do believe that what we are seeing uh, is a real tectonic shift from just the concept of distribution to what we call delivery. And the other mm -hmm. side of that being label and artist services. You know, how are you That's being it. marketed? How are you being promoted? How are you getting positioned in the market? You know, there are groups and companies that are really experts in those, well, in, in those areas, but not just those areas, in regions. Because a lot of, as you know, internationally, regional positioning is so critical for those services to be done. But the act of getting your music to a service, you know, that should be like a faucet and a water, you know, it, it should just always be there and be disconnected from that. Yeah, that, that's, that is absolutely the changing face of distribution. That's an incredibly important topic because it affects everybody, right? Without distribution, no one has access to your monetizable material. And you, you mentioned the thing that from my point of view is really uh, the, the changing face of distribution and that's towards artists and label services. This is the real value it, as, to your point, the end and destination is a commodity. And there's many, many services that offer it. It's incredibly valuable. Again, without it, we don't have a business. But the real value add on top of that and where both the opportunity for innovation and business expansion and also the promise of value that, that companies in the distribution world have to deliver on is what else, right? The, the notion of artists and label services. It's an area I'm spending a lot of my time and a lot of the work I'm doing today is on the different angles on artist label services. Historically, it's been thought of very much as a marketing discipline, perhaps a little bit in A&R, maybe a little production. And it certainly encompasses all those things. But the area I'm seeing, or the, there's two key areas I'm seeing really expand in artist and label services, and that's infrastructure, which is everything we've been talking about so far, uh, because it's a crime to not have your house in order at this point. It's so incredibly easy with so many incredible technologies, including yours. Uh, and then the other half of that is the new technology and new opportunities to truly create either new lines of revenue or efficiencies in your existing line of revenue, right? Things like what AI is doing. Uh, and Edward and I have a very particular perspective on AI that I think is pretty aligned 
of course, the, the hype and the culture and the shiny side of it has some value. But to us, the real value is in the utility and the process side, how it either creates new lines of revenue or really the part that's exciting to me is the creation of efficiencies in your existing lines of revenue, right? AI music listening and tagging, what that's doing for sync and publishing teams is incredible. The new money it's putting in the bank coupled with the reduction of process is an incredible opportunity. Personalization, this is an area uh, when I was on the label side at Concord and Epitaph and Pandora, oh, I'm sorry, Concord Epitaph and, and Universal, a lot of the time we spent with the DSPs was about how do we build more product feature that's about personalization? And there's always a, a tug of war of, well, the masses mostly want this, so that's what we're going to focus on. There's always room for the skunk works. And that was always the exciting part for me, working with a Spotify or an Apple or, or a Tidal or a company like that, where we can try new things. And, and a lot of the personalization that's now empowered by AI, I think is, is a lane worth paying a lot of attention to. Yeah, and, and, and to, you know, to that point, just, just, just as we earlier discussed, the, the, for all that to be possible, you have to have access to your own data. AI is only valuable yes. when it can actually compute something or look at something or be trained on something, prompted on something. So you know, when, when, when we look at how AI in the back end can help, if you're talking about automating creation of marketing blurbs to be able to create you know, more yeah. assets quickly, you need that foundational data. You need to own it. You can't you know, go to your you know, distributor and say, hey, we have a, an interesting thing we want to build. Can we just have access to your database? The general answer will generally be no, because it's, it's complicated and it's proprietary. Yeah. So having your own data to be able to work against, this is why the API program at OpenPlay is such an important one. Because I see a vision in the future that is expanding even to this to this day, where it's no longer just a delivery, it's no longer a push, it's a pull as well. We want app developers, we want DSPs, the future DSPs, to be able to pull from rights holders and their systems, sure. to be able to securely have access to a campaign's worth of data to be able to create an Apple app. Uh, one of the things this industry struggles with, and you know firsthand, is attracting new developers and entrepreneurs into the music markets. Um, historically, it's been it's plagued with a lot of failure, uh, and uh, a lot of that is because it's such a complex industry to build something in. Uh, and our, our journey, even open play, I mean, it was it was it was brutal when we started. You know, uh, when we first attended Music Biz in 2013, with this like doe-eyed look of we're going to solve everyone's problems and we're going to get hugs from everyone in the process. Well, let me tell you, there were no hugs uh, or high fives. It was why are you doing this? This is a complete waste of time. You're going to run out of money before you even build anything. Oh, and we won't even try your product until you're around for three years because it's a waste of our time, right? If if this is how you welcome entrepreneurs into the music space, it really <laughs> makes it difficult for young people to come in. But then you couple that with the fact that there are no open systems of APIs that are, you know, especially in 2010 or 2013, there were not. Um, there were no easy standards. You know, there were DDEX existed as it does today, but very complicated, very difficult to have someone who is 22 years old wanting to build a music app to be able to interface with. You know, th these are the things that this industry has been slowly evolving and but not fast enough because the, the future yeah. of our industry is building on more and more scale across what we already have in place. And we need a lot more of that foundation. Yeah, there's so many practical examples of that that labels and artists are faced with to this day. At least now, we're getting somewhere. I mean, a, a very real example I faced. So I started at UMG in January 2017. Uh, I ran the marketing division of the catalog. And I sit down at my desk day one. I find the restroom and the coffee machine. And I kid you not, one of the very, very first things that day I started thinking about was we have so much repertoire that is not represented visually. Tens of thousands of songs that it, money left on the table. Simple as that, right? Yeah, obviously, YouTube was becoming an incredible uh, engine for both marketing and revenue. It was already a marketing engine for sure, a revenue engine with, with deals in place and, and real money to be made. And the issue was this, right? To create content at scale that is artist that has artistic merit and that I would be proud as a marketer to release, and an artist and a manager would let me release, and that a fan would care to engage with. 
there are many, many steps in the process. To your point, you have to have your house fully in order. I need to understand. I have to have all the metadata very clear. I need the metadata linked to an asset. Um, I need ownership splits. I need all the stuff, right? The unsexy stuff that actually powers the business. Then that's just step one. Step two is I need a platform and a process that can take that and automate the, the scaled creation of video assets on those audio assets. And that unto itself is an incredibly difficult problem to solve because keeping the artistry and, and variety and uniqueness and expressing the art through that video, right? Like an art track isn't going to cut it. I mean, that was essentially the interim solution, which was better than nothing. But I wanted to create premium video that would get premium royalties and would be premium market, would feed premium marketing campaigns. It wasn't an option. I essentially jettisoned it. Templates weren't going to do it for me. Today, now we have the structure. We have multiple AI tools that can take all that information and with a little bit or a lot of human guidance, which there should be to keep the art and, and, and the artistry together, you can create this at scale. The issue, however, is feeding it. That's what you're talking about. It goes back to having your house in order. I can't stress this enough that having your metadata, your splits, your assets in an incredibly controlled and modular fashion is imperative to successful marketing. I think this is where a lot of people don't connect the dots. Um, in a modern marketplace that we live in today, you cannot market effectively without everything else we just talked about, an organized structure, because there's far too many places. We have to be everywhere in various formats. Scale is one of the critical words in marketing now. And I, luckily, we're at a place where the tools exist. Finally, like truly end-to-end -end tools exist. Now it's about internalizing that infrastructure into the rights holders. And that is, of course, a massive process that thankfully is keeping me gainfully employed. But but you you know and, and again to to all those points uh, what we're seeing we're seeing finally in the last three years a, a kind of a, a resurgence of entrepreneurship in the music markets maybe it's because the Goldman reports have been so great that everyone's like ah oh, there's actually money here where you know cash, years cash. ago no one figured that there was you know investors ran for music. Uh, unless they're utopian investors, uh, ran from music because it was, you know, a very uh, kind of fearful place to, to park your money. Most startups failed. Um, and, uh, you know, open play to this to this day has taken no money from anyone, uh, only because in the early days we tried and no one wanted to give us any. And, you know, now we're in a different situation. But what it allowed us to do uh, is to really build the program the way we want it to. You know, we, we, we're known in our industry of not always saying yes to everything. Uh, this is odd for vendors. This is odd for entrepreneurs who are generally saying yes to anyone in order to keep growing their business. Uh, we've been more methodical. Uh, we've been very careful with how we grow because what we found was there's a lot of, a lot of uh, bluster in areas of our industry that change overnight. And the people who tend to re revamp their business strategy to meet those moments tend to fail fastest. We look at a long-term presence, right? We, we've we been around now for, for, for over uh, 12 years. It really is something that we cherish. The open play has never had one day of downtime in, since we launched. Uh, everything we do is all about making sure that our customers and our partners have access to their content 24 seven, wherever they may be. And we have thousands of labels who are reliant on open play on, an, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and a lot of those labels come through some of our best distribution relationships. We have large uh, distributors who work with us day-to-day. -day. Uh, we want to work with more distributors as we scale because we see ourselves as Salesforce, as NetSuite. We see ourselves as a unified content and rights platform that is really uh, allowing you, the rights holder, to be as creative with your deals as possible. You want to have one party work your catalog in, in Asia, another one in, La in Latin America, another one in Europe. You don't need to have three different entry points of the same data into different systems. You want to control it from one point of entry. And what, what we've seen uh, is that the amount of garbage that goes into the markets on a day-to-day -day basis only because it has to be rekeyed and re-entered as rights relationships change is one of the biggest detriments 
that that we have in the space. We we have a cottage industry that you know very well has spawned about finding money in black boxes. Finding money is kind of the, 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 the latest and greatest game that's being played because end of the day, they're looking for mistakes that could have been prevented from day one, mm -hmm. that could have been properly avoided. Well, let's talk about this one because this is something you and I are incredibly passionate about. I'm going to buckle up because I know you really have some, some position on this. Solving the industry data problem, the data problem, <laughs> right? You, what you and I have talked about violently over lots of, of tequila and or vodka, usually not together, but often <laughs> one of the two, is why do we wait until it's a problem to solve it when actually just getting ahead of it, given we've had 15, 20 years knowing this is where it was headed? Why, why do we do this to ourselves? And are we any better at it today than we used to be? Well, well, one, because there's a business to be had there to getting data wrong uh, and some on some parts. Uh, uh, obviously, no one wants to have bad data, but what ends up happening is that it becomes, it, it happens organically. And let me give you the simplest example uh, of what we see almost day to day when we deal with labels and even our own experience from Concord. Um, think about the amount of money and time we at Concord put in to cleaning up our data. We had rooms full of people who are, you know, Concord made investments, huge investments into buying its own CDs back from eBay to be able to key in every aspect of data. Um, and they did this because they knew that this was not only the predominance of getting paid properly and, and the right thing to do with artists in general, but it's because they knew that if we did this once and we controlled this data, one, we'd never have to do it again, and we'd be able to make sure that it's right in the industry everywhere. What ends up happening today with most labels is they tend to be trusting their data in the hands of other people's systems exclusively, not having real copies of their own data. And they might invest in a cleanup in one of those systems, but when that relationship ends, one of our biggest problems in our industry is data portability. Most of these groups will not give back the data. They will say, you know what? Go rekey it. You know, good luck. You know, you're no longer our business partner. You can't have your data back. We see this and hear this every day. It's 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 yeah. a, not a great practice, given that incredibly imagine problematic. Switch, imagine you switch banks, Jason, and they're like, oh well, we 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 can't actually Keeping the wire money. you that. We can't wire that bank the money. We don't know their format, so you know, we just can't send it. Right. This this right. to me is how crazy all this sounds, and it still happens to this day. And when that next system gets used by that same label, they will not be as diligent in cleaning up that data. They might only put in the primary artist now and not the 10 other contributors mm -hmm. that played a role on that track because they're just tired of it. They're tired of having to clean up, rekey, and, and not be able to move that to every new relationship that they move into. And this is one of the things that we are really trying to solve in this market is, is data portability. Yeah. And, and it's not like we're saying one database needs to rule them all. I, I'm not a big fan of single database monoliths anywhere. What we're saying yeah. is this industry needs to accept data portability and every partner, the, every distributor, anybody who has a system of record, make it so that you can get your data out anytime you want. Make it so you can put your data in any way you want, especially if it meets an industry standard like DDAX. And more importantly, make APIs accessible so people can pull from your data sets, from interface with your data, as opposed to having to wait for you to build some packager to send it to them. And this will, I think, solve so much of our problems in our space if we solve the data portability problem in our market. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And and it, it has tentacles into all aspects of the business. I think this is where, you know, if you're sitting on the marketing team, you might not be thinking about this much every, all day, every day. Uh, you know, perhaps it's my engineering background because in any marketing role I sat in, I was always thinking about this, right? I need incredibly quick, comprehensive, accurate, portable access to my data. It powers all of my campaigns. Great example where I really learned this when I was at Epitaph working for, for Brett Gerwitz and Dave Hansen, right? Brett um, was and is incredibly focused on this. And he was one of the people I worked with in my entire career that was most clear on the value 
of having the house in order all the time, house in order, house in order. And so this was about choosing the right platforms, having all data from the start, right? Getting back to my question, let's not wait to solve this when, oh, we have this incredible marketing or commercial opportunity, but we can't plug into it because we can't deliver what they need. Uh, let's not wait till that happens. And instead, let's structure something from the beginning, at least with the, the best visibility we have today. Standards are going to change, opportunities will evolve, but no one has ever had a problem from keeping things too organized and ensuring accuracy in their data. I mean, I've, I spent hours or days or weeks cleaning up YouTube when I was at Epitaph, where, uh, you know, as, as a legacy problem, where I'm sure everyone knows if you have three splits and it adds up to 99.99% at the time, no one is getting paid. That may still hold true. Uh, so someone needs 33.34, right? It's those simple things where you don't think about that, but if I need to use that video asset as a fundamental deliverable in a campaign and I'm sending all traffic to it and I have a wildly successful campaign and then I realized, oh, that was just a marketing asset, not a monetized marketing asset, which is like the thing, uh, well, what just happened, right? We just lost meaningful revenue. And then you scale that and multiply that across you know, the scale of large labels or in aggregate small labels. That's one example. I'm sure if we had 10 hours, we could fill it with 10,000 more examples. So I'm, I come at it from a, a couple of other angles than you. You're coming at it from the source, right? Single source of truth. I'm coming at it from application, from yep. a digital strategy perspective. How are we distributing this and using it? From a marketing perspective, how are we building content and narrative? And then for a commerce perspective, Right? Because practically every marketing asset in existence today is monetizable if you just set up your, your information and your campaigns right. So, yeah, I'm incredibly fired up about this endlessly. Well, this is, this is also why uh, every, every couple of years when we see certain technologies become buzzwords that uh, are, are claiming they will solve a problem, which we, you and I know, will not be solved by that technology, it, 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 it actually moves the industry backwards a bit, right? You know, when, when as, as you and I were on every panel talk, hearing blockchain being talked about nonstop as the, as the savior of all of these payment problems and all of these identification problems, it, it, knowing the technology is, is a, you know, what, so advanced for where this industry is, that it will never be ready to solve problems until we solve the underlying problems, right? Where we, it's hard to talk about blockchain where the other end of the equation is AS400 systems and spreadsheets, right? You and, and no APIs, right? I'm Cobol. thinking, why don't we baby step in our industry first? Let's build data portability. Let's build APIs across our platforms before we get into futuristic technologies that no one's ready for from a, from an implementation standpoint. And, and I have a lot of respect for a lot of companies that have tried to implement blockchain systems into uh, existing systems, but where they all fall flat is the technology on the, on, the, on the other end was built in the 90s. And we have to close that gap before we get into the new side. And AI is already trending kind of in that same vein. We, there, there's so much possibilities that we're seeing pop up but it's all predicated on interfaces. It's all predicated on, on getting access to, to data that makes sense to use AI around. You know, what at OpenPlay, we are we're we're very careful with how we explore AI. But for us, AI is how do we enhance data? How do we take every piece of metadata in OpenPlay yes. and allow you to translate it into 240 languages with a press of a button? How do we make it so that those translations make it to the DSPs in those regions so that they can use those translation sets to find this relevant music? Uh, these are areas that I think, again, while everyone is fearful of, you know, this will el eliminate the need for a songwriter or this will eliminate the need for an artist, we're thinking that this is going to eliminate the need for a bunch of data entry, a bunch of people who have to do language translations, uh, people who yeah. are sitting in, in accounting departments who are marrying UPC codes and ISRC codes. I mean, here's an AI trick for anyone. Take the last 20 statements that you guys receive from every group that you might receive it and prompt ChatGPT to have one format you want to translate all those to. It will translate them unbelievably <laughs> well, better than anyone you yeah. have on your staff. These are the kind of things that will really solve a lot of issues and problems, catch problems with payments. All of these things need to be applied, but they're all predicated on you controlling your data. So when you go back to your labels, 
you'll go back to your rights holders, ask where your content is, who is the metadata, who has the contractual rights, who has access to the content. And if it's not in your walls or you have, you're the ones paying to have it in your walls, it's not your data. You know, Bitcoin has a, has a statement that says it's not your keys, not your data. I've always felt that way about metadata and your systems. If it's not in your walls, if it's not something you control or have access to, you really don't have access to it as much as you think you do. Yeah. And, you know, we, we suffer in this industry, like many, but I think music especially, of shiny object syndrome, right? Like, ooh, Web3, ooh, NFTs, ooh, AI, you know, way back when, ooh, bear share, right? whatever. And that's fine because music and culture are directly linked. They each draw, you know, drive each other and shiny object is a catalyst for that momentum. So of course, that's a lot of what we do, but that takes our eye off of the thing that matters. And that's what you were talking about. And I see in the chat, people agree that's work on your foundational things, work on the structure, work on the legacy problems, because if you don't solve those, you're not prepared to capitalize, like really integrate into your business. Maybe you can test something out and kick the tires, but to truly integrate a modern shiny piece of technology into your business, I can't think of a single one today that doesn't require a truly organized, structured set of data and assets and binaries and deliverables. And, and for so us, I, know uh, I, I just want to just, just talk about where we are going, right? We, we built uh, the foundation of open play with early not knowing that the combination of, of composition and recording had to be there from the start, right? So we, we have always modeled a publishing element to open play. And this year, in the first half of this year, we're rolling out our full publishing program which will include everything from CWR generation to management of, of, of deliveries outbound. This marries right into our recorded music program because a lot of our customers overlap between publishing and recorded music. I think we're gonna see more and more of that happening. And this is why foundational data for us is so critical because we do see us expanding into the, the publishing arena. Um, and in the you know three to five year horizon, what we built is very applicable to TV, film, video games, um, and, and uh, books. Every type of asset class similar to music struggles with the same problems, except music is usually the canary in the coal mine. They're usually the mm -hmm. ones that see things ahead of others or experience the problems earlier, but our solutions are going to be the same for those other industries. Yep. That's always the way. Always the way. So we are just about out of time. Let's do this real quick. Um, in 30 seconds or less, what do you think, what's your next big focus? Then I'll do the same and then we'll see if there's any questions we can get to. Next big focus. Next big focus. We are continuing to expand our recorded music programs. We're about to announce a, a, another distribution relationship that will hopefully help a lot of independent labels in, in the music market. We have our eagerness to roll out our publishing program and sign up a few hundred publishers this year. And we are looking to expand further with some of our bigger distribution partners to integrate open play for data portability into their platforms so that we can have our labels use their services more effectively without having to lose access to their own content. I like all that. It powers everything we just talked about for an hour. I love it. Uh, for me, it's you know, the, the other end of that, right? It's the continued integration into labels and music tech platforms and rights holders uh, of new technology married up to infrastructure. That, that to me is, is really the most exciting part of, of the business right now. Um, I've sort of, I've taken my engineering background and my marketing and everything in the middle and I've jammed them together. And this is the output, is understanding how technology and platforms and ecosystems empower the sync team, the marketing team, the ANR team, the finance teams. It's ex incredibly exciting work and I'm, I'm thrilled to see what this year looks like as so much technology has emerged around it. And then the other parentheses for me is, as um, Tom said in the intro, I, I joined the UCLA um, Herb Alpert School of Music recently as a lecturer in the music business program and we're in week two right now. And I couldn't be more excited about that. I've been teaching music business for 20 years between Musicians Institute and Berkeley um, and now at UCLA. And it's I look forward to a had... constant stream of the best interns that you can find us. Oh, that's a giant plus, right? And, <laughs> you know, for me, like, I, I'm sure we've all had those like singular moments where someone took an interest in you and it changed the course of your life. 
I mean, you and I could, I mean, at Concord could go through a number, a long list, Norman Lear, uh, like Bob, but, all the, but you know, and, and if I can pay that forward just a little bit, that is like such the most like soul nurturing thing. In That's the, the message of the day, Jason, everyone pay it forward because everyone starts somewhere. We have to not, That's right. we want new entrepreneurs to not endure some of the pains and struggles we did. And the way to do that That's is right. pay it forward, work with them, embrace them and fund them. <laughs> Yeah. It, and it's rewarding, right? Like we've done a lot. We've seen a lot. We've learned a lot of hard lessons. We could do a whole second episode just on our hard lessons. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, the notion of like summing that up and delivering that as a prepackaged, um, organized to the, to the point of today's topic, a piece of, of knowledge to the future, you know, executives in our business. It's a really rewarding thing. Anyone, if you have a chance to do it, I can't endorse it enough. Well, thanks, Jason. This um, is awesome as always. Yeah, always fun. Always fun. Uh, do we have any more time, Tom, to hit a few questions, or is that that? Um, there were a couple questions, but I'm going to ask a couple that I'm curious about. What is this about being a voracious vinyl fan? Tell us a little bit about your vinyl collection. <laughs> we definitely need episode two if we're going there. I'll uh, I'll sum it up as quick as I can. So I. You know, like many people, my I, an older relative was a vinyl fanatic and schooled me when I was you know this tall, you know, and how to listen to vinyl and the benefit. And you know, as a an epic music fanatic on every level, on the branding, on the fidelity, on the collectability, on the fanaticism, on the connection to artists, vinyl checks all the boxes. Uh, and so I've been collecting vinyl since I was really in middle school. Uh, I, I primarily focus on late 70s, early 80s punk. That's like the collection aspect. I have you know, some ridiculously rare and valuable records. But for me, it's about the ritual. For some of you that know me, you've probably seen, I, I did a video with Henry Rollins where he interviewed me about my vinyl fanaticism. And I'll, I'll find a way to link it if anyone's interested. And what I talk about in that, that he and I are just like super nerding out about, is the, 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 the ritual. Right? There's a process. You pull out the record. You think about the right record for the moment. You have to be careful because you can break it. It's fragile. You place it on the turntable. There's a process there. And then typically, you sit back and engage and you listen. You look at the liner notes. And for me as a marketer, I think about the choices. Right? Like, Why is that Ramones cover that? Why is that that photo, those colors, uh, you know, and the color of the vinyl, the choices of the song tracking? I mean... I, I guess maybe the way to sum it up, because again, I could literally go on for an hour. To me, vinyl is the ultimate fundamental representation of the best things about music fanaticism in the most condensed package available. I, I, I just know vinyl from the sense that every time there's a music biz, Jason would, back when he was at Universal, sneak me into the Universal suite at the, you know, the top floor where every piece of vinyl is out there. And he's like, well, take your pick. I'm like, ah, this, this, this is Jason. <laughs> yeah. Pay it forward. Pay it yeah. forward any way you can. That's beautiful. Well, guys, speaking of volume two of this episode, there's been several people chiming in on the chat about extending this conversation to a later date. And if you two are down with it, I would love to bring you back for a, another kind of peel the onion, so to speak, on, on the metadata discussion. And also, we want to learn a little bit more about you guys as human beings beyond your what you've talked about today. So I think we'd love that. Please think about Happy that. Too. To the audience, I told you you'd get a treat today. I told you'd leave more inspired than you arrived. The encouragement to pay it forward from these two guys is something we can all relate to. So thank you for that. Um, gentlemen, I really appreciate knowing you and having you in my constellation of rock stars. I look forward to carrying forward in the future. And then last, my sign off is always be nice to each other. And so we will see you on the flip side. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, guys. A pleasure. Pleasure.